everyday injustice. Too many wrongful convictions, corruption has infected the criminal justice system. Leaving too many people helpless, fighting for their lives instead of receiving justice, people suffer. Is that why they say justice is blind? Today on Everyday Injustice, we have Eric Altieri. He is the former director of Normal, and uh, he's the interim director of campaigns for Clean Slate Initiative. How you doing? Doing great. How are you? So tell us about um, the Clean Slate Initiative. Sure. So the Clean Slate Initiative, uh, we're a national advocacy group um, that is working on providing pathways in all 50 states to automated record expungement. And what that means is once you've served your time um, for a criminal conviction, that you come out and you remain crime free, the state will automate the process of clearing your record. So you don't have to go through a Byzantine maze of laws and legalese and hiring lawyers and fees. Uh, but you've shown that you've you know filled your time and done your due for society and you're ready to be back on you know, equal footing with everyone else and have a clean slate to move forward and really be successful in life again. And are you doing this nationally? Yes. Uh, so we work both at the federal level. We have a federal department, uh, but we also are working across all 50 states. Um, we've already approved clean slate legislation in 12 um, that are setting up their automated processes, but we're working in every other state as well. Um, in some places, that's a much longer term map, whether that's political or technical reasons. Uh, but we work with our partners on the ground in all these states across the country to get that state on track um, to really providing second chances for millions of individuals in America. And how does that work exactly? Sure. Um, from the standpoint of the policy or from CSI's strategy? Well, from the standpoint of if somebody wanted to to clean their slate, how would they do it? Well, currently uh, we deal, most states have a petition-based system um, and that can be very long and drawn out and difficult or slightly easier depending on the state. But no matter what, it still really involves a process that's not well known, it's not well publicized. You have to wait certain periods of time. You often have to then go to a certain courthouse or to the police department get your record directly, file a request for that, get a lawyer, fill out a petition, fill out paperwork, sometimes pay a fee of hundreds of dollars, wait more months for a review. It's a really long process. Uh, so with Clean Slate, um, what we're really doing is also bringing smart technology to play across these states um, that really frees up resources and makes state government more efficient while delivering you know, great outcomes for their citizens. So then this system that would be put in place after clean slate, um, you know, think of it almost as an algorithm. It'll go through if the law says after five years, after you leave jail and served your term and you haven't committed a crime, that we wipe your slate clean. Um, someone at the clerk's office, usually the Department of Courts or a place like that, will go through and it'll pull all those records. They'll be reviewed and then cleared without the individual actually having to really take that responsibility on their own. Um, and a lot of times we see that you know, only less, less than 10% of people who would be able to have their records cleared under the petition-based process do so. And that's because of just all the hurdles that are in place. Um, so we're really just working on making that system work better for individuals and for the government. And, and who is generally eligible to have their slate cleaned? Uh, in most states, uh, that typically includes really all nonviolent misdemeanors, um, usually certain felonies. The waiting times will be different. Um, nonviolent felonies, you may see a waiting period of, you know, eight, 10 years. Nonviolent misdemeanors, sometimes it's three to five years. Uh, but, you know, a lot of that is what you'd expect. Some of that is people who, you know, due to poverty have bounced checks that they're trying to pay their bills and then were charged with that. Um, equally disturbing, there is about 11 million individuals with non-conviction records. They never were convicted of a crime, but they are still carrying that record and face all the same hurdles and blocks that someone with an actual criminal record does. Um, so those would be automated to be expunged. A lot of it's nonviolent marijuana records, um, as you know, I've seen in my previous work with the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws or Normal. We were arresting, you know, 750,000 people a year for simple marijuana possession. And a lot of it, you know, would be that. Um, we've seen that come up as really the first block that gets cleared in a lot of states. Uh, but it really runs the gamut. Um, and it's just simply, you know, if we want to get people back on track and be productive members of society, we can't keep putting hurdles between them, jobs, housing, education, a fruitful life. 
um, that just leads to recidivism and really outcomes that no one wants. We want a healthy and productive society and, you know, the best for our fellow Americans. And that's what we're trying to do by giving them a second chance through Clean Slate. And a lot of people don't recognize just how much of a burden this is. And I, I have a great example from my own life. Uh, my wife used to work as a union organizer and she went to Texas one time and they intentionally got themselves arrested at a protest trying to unionize janitors. Now you can imagine that's probably the most innocuous, even probably more than marijuana uh, conviction that you can have on a record, but it was a misdemeanor. And so uh, when we went to adopt our daughter 15 years ago, um, she had to actually apply to the DOJ for a waiver in order to be able to adopt a child. Now that, you know, not the usual thing that somebody, you know, has to do, but, you know, it's just an example of uh, how much of a burden this can be. And then you can imagine people that are not similarly situated that have actual you know, records that, that are less innocuous uh, and what they have to do to get jobs, to get uh, housing, to get benefits, to get into the university, to get, um, you know, uh, benefits for the university. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, it's a long list of stuff that we, we make this really hard for people. We do. Um, you know, we've turned, a, you know, a misdemeanor into a life sentence in a lot of ways um, and what we really throw on people in terms of collateral consequences of a record. You know, there is more of than 42,000 restrictions on individuals in this country at the state and federal level. If you have a criminal record, um, that could be whether it's adopting, like you said, um, I've heard a terrible story of a father who wanted to go see his son graduate from military academy. They ran background checks on attendees. He couldn't go see his son graduate. Um, if you want to go to college, now you're not getting federal financial aid, so you can't afford to go to college and you know put yourself in a better position to get that good job. But you probably want to get that job anyway now because you have a criminal record and you know 70 to 90 percent of depending the field do that background check and we'll pull that up and you're immediately not judged based on your skills, your character, where you are currently. You're being judged based on that one mistake you made, you know, 10 years ago in a lot of cases. And that just keeps people really desperate and in poverty. It doesn't let, and that impacts not just them. You know, it's not just a penalty on the individual. It's a penalty on their families, on their children who aren't, on their communities who then suffer because they don't have this individual contributing in the way they truly can. Um, it's something that isn't often thought about, you know, by folks without a record. And so you really have to deal with it yourself and you're suddenly there. And that's a lot of Americans. One in three Americans have a criminal record in this country. So you're talking around 100 million people in this country right now are facing this problem. And that's an incredible number. But, you know, if you think about what the goal of, you know, punishment and rehabilitation is, it's to get people, you know, let's say they made a mistake. Um, well, how do you get them back into society and contributing you allow them to get jobs and all sorts of other things why does it make sense to make it really hard to do that there's this real sense of you know especially these hangover laws from decades ago hard on crime laws where it has to be super punitive and draconic on how we treat individuals but you're absolutely right the punishment in our court system are supposed to function in that you, you know, you're punished for what you have done, but then we rehabilitate you to society. We may help you become a productive member of society. It doesn't do me any good if my neighbor, because he has a misdemeanor for bouncing a check 10 years ago, can't get a job and now he's foreclosing on his house and he can't take his, send his kids to college. We want society to be better and more productive. So it doesn't even have to be this raw compassion thing, but it should be as well. These are our fellow Americans. And we really want, you know, if a strong society, a happy society, a healthy society, we really have to look at this in a serious way. Um, and the solution's right in front of us. And thankfully, it's it's rather simple in a lot of ways. Um, and it, whether that's just bringing this to 50 states, but also the federal level, um, where there's still, you know, several, uh, over 100 to 200,000 uh, people that are at the federal level with their records. And you mentioned the term collateral consequence, which I think is an important term. Um, and 
the interesting thing, and I know your background, uh, as you mentioned, is in marijuana laws. A lot of these collateral consequences don't distinguish between marijuana and fentanyl and cocaine and heroin and all this other stuff. Um, and so you're basically, you know, somebody smokes a little weed and they get caught by the cops. That's no different than having, you know, heroin on you. No, it, uh, you know, most of these restrictions and hurdles are blind to what the charge is. It could be because you were arrested for smoking a joint or something far more severe. You're all treated the same way. Um, and we've seen, you know, with marijuana laws in particular, which represent a huge number of, you know, nonviolent misdemeanors in this country, it's even more patently absurd when you know 50% of the country now lives in a state where marijuana use is legal. Um, so, you know, it's about really making up for those mistakes we had in our law um, and really replacing bad policy with smart policy. Uh, we can't just keep doing the same thing because it's always done that. And that leads to all these collateral consequences and all this devastation for communities and individuals in America. We got We have to move forward and we have to be pragmatic about how we handle this. No one benefits by forcing someone with a misdemeanor to never have a good job again for the rest of their lives. No one should be defined by a mistake they made by that one bad day they had. We need to provide a pathway to move forward or there's truly no you know, hope for the future uh, for our fellow Americans. And people think it can't be them, but as you know, we just pointed out a minute ago, one in three Americans, there's a good chance you have a record, a loved one has a record, you're one of your good friends has a record, or you can have one in the future. Um, this is really widespread and it's just holding back the potential of individuals and our country writ large. And there's another layer to this because the impacts of this are not spread out e evenly. Um, so the people most likely to get caught up in the system are A, low-income people, and B, people of color. So, so this perpetuates that uh, discrimination. This perpetuates the biggest injustices against marginalized communities, people of color and, and you know, the working poor, as you say, the working class. People who already are having a tough time getting by because of these structural problems, and now you're going to put even more barriers between that. Um, you know, and you asked earlier, you know, why aren't people doing a petition process? Well, if you ha you're living paycheck to paycheck and you barely have a job and you're working under the table and it costs three hundred dollars and a whole day to go to the court to file your first step of the petition, a lot of people can't do that. A lot of people don't have the time or resources. They have kids to take care of. If they don't show up to work that day, they get fired and they have no income. Uh, we really shouldn't be putting even more burden on people who are already struggling. Um, we should be giving them really, you know, a hand up. We should really be helping them get back into a functional place and to do better for themselves and their families and children. And I know you brought this up before, but I want to kind of reiterate this, but these collateral consequences are life sentences effectively. They don't expire. They don't expire. There's no way around it um, until you get that record cleared, it, really. If you, if you don't go through the petition process or live in a place that implements clean slate, and you just have that record, it's not like, oh, I'll wait five more years and apply for that federal financial aid to go to college and get that degree and get that job. You're never going. You're never getting that financial aid as long as that's on there. It's, you know, it's that scarlet letter that's just emblazoned on you for the rest of your life, and you just have to carry that. Um, and that's really the point and was the motivation behind Clean Slate coming together as an organization in the first place, that it shouldn't be that way. Our founder, for instance, um, Sheena Mead, is that one person I was talking about? Uh, bounced a check uh, paying for food at Walmart. It would, I believe it was like twenty-seven dollars, twenty-eight dollars. It was something marginal. It bounced, got a criminal record, and then you know, with her with her several children, realized now I can't rent that new apartment. Now I can't get this job, um, and that's really just unacceptable. We are in the modern day in America, a country that frames itself as this country that loves freedom and liberty and possibility. We can't keep doing this. So let me ask you a little trickier question. Um, so why are you focused on the back end of this, cleaning the slate, rather than wiping out the collateral consequences? Sure. Um, so, you know, the universe that works on these issues is immense. Um, so it's not as it's not one or the other type thing. We work with a lot of allies that are doing all different aspects of this to really fix a lot of the system. 
but it's going to take all of us working together to fix that. There's not one cure all. No one's saying either that clean slate immediately solves all these problems. Um, but it really helps millions of people. So if we can do this while simultaneously working with allies and other groups are working on other aspects to fix those other laws, um, the sum of all of that together will really produce this world. I think that we all as Americans want to live in. Um, it's not exclusive to this. Um, there is support that we give across the board. And, you know, as you can see, even just in my career, um, there's so much overlap. I went working on marijuana laws, which involved working on automated expungement uh, for those charges, um, to seeing that this is another avenue to bring relief and to really fix this system and bring a sense of fairness back. Uh, so it's definitely not exclusive. Uh, we work with other groups on other issues. But for Clean Slate Initiative, um, it's right there in the name. This is This is our issue. And this is one that we think benefits really society and also brings some smart government back that I think people want to see. Um, it's It helps put people back into the workforce, um, which is why we work with business groups. Uh, JP Morgan is supportive of this. Um, we have a whole Microsoft is supportive of this. Uh, we have a wide range of corporations that want this from a workforce development angle. The government tends to want this from a you know more efficient government angle. It saves them money dealing with these paper records they've been dealing with. Um, there's a lot of ways that this really brings a lot of solutions to the table, um, and that's why Clean Slate is Clean Slate Initiative. Um, that's what we do, uh, but certainly are supportive of really all these efforts across the country to fix any number of issues. I just figured people might ask that, but you know, from my perspective, it seems like this might be the simplest way as well, because otherwise you have to deal with it law by law by law. Yeah. And and that's at every state is different. So you, it wouldn't mean just be, too. you know, changing one one rule. You'd have to go into state and change 30, uh, change 100 here. Um, as I mentioned, there's over 42,000 restrictions um, across this country on individuals of records. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, I think it's everything together all at once in a way. Um, you have to keep working on all these issues to improve our, you know, our system to really bring justice. Uh, but this is one that it it's common sense. It's it's easy to explain. Um, and it's something that once you sit people down and talk to them about it, um, they really get it. Yeah, and 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 certainly for things like marijuana offenses, it's probably a lot of people will support it. Uh, for some of the other things, do you see more pushback? Uh, I mean, you do, um, but you we make clear, um, and really it helps bring people around that it requires these longer waiting periods, especially for this, if it's a very serious charge, you know, some places, if it's a more serious felony, there's a 10 year waiting period. States are deciding based on their own values, kind of where to place those. Um, and if someone went and went crime free for that long, I mean, what threat are they really presenting? Um, they're trying, you're going to really only increase the likelihood of potential recidivism, the harder you make it. Um, so we, they do serve their time. They do prove themselves. Um, and if they go crime free for that long, I, when you talk to people, you talk about redemption, you talk about second chances, um, even beyond marijuana, they get it for these other charges. Yeah, but from my perspective, at least, you know, having these collateral consequences just doesn't make a lot of sense in most cases. They're not directly related. Um, you know, I I interviewed somebody a year or so ago, and she was talking about a client that they had. Um, and it wasn't her that had committed the crime even, it was um, a family member and that blocked them from getting housing or it blocked the, uh, blocked the son from staying with them at the housing. I mean, there are just so many layers to this. There are, and it's, you know, it's in a lot of ways, uh, kind of sub rosa here. A lot of people, average Americans don't necessarily see the widespread impacts, but it's this, you know, it's almost this pernicious octopus. It's got its tentacles and everything. And you start seeing those. Um, I don't think anyone would think it's fair that, you know, someone's relative now can't get a roof over their heads because someone else in their family had committed a, you know, a crime and was charged. Uh, someone's son who's now risking, where do I even live because of that? Uh, it's just, it gets the more you dig, the more egregious it gets, um, and the harder I think it is to defend on its face. Um, and that's why I don't think you see a lot of people defending it. Um, you do see pretty heavy support, certainly amongst the public. Most of the time, um, when you pull this question, uh, when we would put when we pulled marijuana expungements alone recently, that was as high as eighty percent, ninety percent. Um, that's you know a, a done issue. But even when you just talk about broad, broad uh, expungement efforts for 
uh, misdemeanors and nonviolent felonies, you're looking at 70%. Um, and that's before they even really hear all that messaging and do the research. Uh, so it's it's a common sense policy um, that has bipartisan support. We've seen it passed in places like California, but also Oklahoma. Um, the governor of Oklahoma is a huge supporter of this policy. He championed it. Uh, he was at our convening, our conference we did in Oklahoma City just last year. He was so proud of this policy. He talks about it on the trail. Um, you see it really in all stripes. It's one of those few issues left um, in this really polarized country that you see both sides kind of come together on this one. Yeah, and I can definitely see that. Um, I can also see, you know, uh, some of the reasoning for, you know, for example, you might not want a drug dealer uh, to be living in public housing. So I can see, mm -hmm. you know, a point to that up to a point. But, you know, the real problem, I think, is that if you want people to be able to get back into society, and this gets back to my initial point, and I work with a lot of people that are currently and formerly incarcerated, and they just make it really difficult for these people to, you know, get jobs, be able to get their benefits and get back on their feet. And so what happens when they can't? Well, yep. they have to go back into the illegal economy. Well, even, you know, that the drug dealer kind of example you gave, uh, you know, a overwhelming amount of, you know, drug dealing and drug trafficking charges are crimes of poverty in the first place. Individuals go to that because they don't have a lot of options in society. And that lead, that's for a whole nother number of reasons uh, that, that isn't really my purview. But if they get out for that charge, they serve their time and they remain crime free. If you don't let them live in that house, they don't have anywhere to go. How are they going to live? How are they going to make money? How are they going to feed their kids? Um, by we're, they're kind of getting the exact opposite result they get by being so draconic and punitive on people who have served their time uh, by making it so hard. And in a lot of ways, you're cutting off the viable avenues of going to college, securing a house, securing that good job, and really leaving them not a lot of options. And when people get desperate, that's when you really see a lot of these problems. And I've seen, you know, people on an individual level, okay, they'll petition uh, the court to get their record expunged. It goes before the judge. Uh, if the DA doesn't oppose it, which they often will yep. oppose it, um, then the judge will clear it. And it, you know, it, it takes some time, but it, it's kind of doable. Um, but when you're talking about, you know, tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of cases, um, uh, that's from a functional government basis, how do you do it? If everyone decided to go, the whole system would collapse. Um, in many ways, the petition system works because they made it so difficult that fewer than 10% apply. If you had 90% of people applying, you'd have lines around you know, the, the courtrooms in this country for blocks. So how can this work so that it's really streamlined? I, I, as it is now, um, we work with our national partners, um, you know, particularly, you know, we have groups that do technology only. They're non-advocacy groups. We work with uh, technology firms and individuals to help the clerk's offices, really. Um, it's a process of making sure a state, you know, digitizes their records, knows where those records are stored. Some places they're in multiple repositories across the state. You know, Department of Police has it, Department of Courts has it. We know where that is. And you can build a really, you know, a computer program, essentially, that will clear, go through these digitized records uh, based on the metrics you put in. So it'd be, you know, able to say if this state was, you clear your misdemeanor if you're crime free after five years. It would pull those on a routine basis, clear those out, make sure those aren't showing up in background checks anymore. Um, and then that individual can apply for that job. They can apply for that apartment. They can, you know, go for that certification to, to be a hairstylist or whatever they want to do. Things that are currently off the table for them now. Now, would they know that their record is clear? Is there a notification system? Notification is where it gets a, a bit tricky, um, and we're seeing a lot of states try different things. Uh, typically, um, we are seeing portals uh, set up. Utah has one. Uh, Colorado just launched theirs when they started implementing this. Actually, just this month, Colorado just implemented their clean slate law, uh, where you largely go in, you put in some identifying information for yourself, um, you know, name, last four digits of social, that kind of thing, um, and it'll pull up your 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 record and if it's been cleared and if you're eligible for that. Um, and that's something we need to make sure governments make as streamlined as easy as possible. Because if we just make that even harder, 
Um, there's no point in clearing a record if an individual doesn't know it's cleared, right? Um, if you don't know, if you don't know your record's been cleared, you're living like you have a record still. Um, so you're not actually really gaining that benefit. Well, it's potentially uh, worse than that because if you think your record is cleared and it's not, um, yeah. then you're potentially looking at perjury. Yeah, that too. <laughs> and we don't want that. Now you have a whole new record. Yeah, um, exactly. So, so yes, uh, notifications are really important. Um, and since it's you know an early policy, we're seeing states try some different avenues. Uh, portals seem to be the way to go, but how we make that as efficient as possible, make sure governments are promoting that uh, to individuals so they know it exists to go check that. Um, in some places, they're working on um, working with the Bureau of Prisons and individual states. So this is part of your you know reentry to society packet. You get the information letting you know this exists. Uh, so it's very important. Notification is a, a crucial aspect. Um, and that needs to be something the government funds and considers. Um, and that's why at Clean Slate, when we work with our state partners on these campaigns, we start with uh, pre-legislation where it's just building to make sure they can do it to get champion the bill. But then we don't just leave. Um, we continue to work with our partners and be a resource uh, through the implementation process, through the notification process to make this sure this is done right. Now, I'm not sure if you track this, but do you know like what state has done the best job of this? Uh, you know, Pennsylvania is like an incredible example. Um, they've done hundreds of thousands of records, um, and they like it so much in Pennsylvania, they just passed their third expansion, their clean slate law, on their own clean slate 3.0. They added more charges from the um, after the initial bill, and they went back and added even more, adjusted some waiting times, made this available to more people. Um, also, more recently, Michigan implemented this last year. Um, you know, day one, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people um, were ready to receive relief. Uh, we've seen this done pretty well uh, in most states. Um, and now that we have 12 states that have approved it, you have this community of practice, really, where uh, states can kind of look to others who have gone before them um, and make sure they're using best practices and avoiding any pitfalls that other states may have seen. And do you track, like, states that are really bad at this? <laughs> Well, we, we are. Um, the thing is, it's just so exceptionally early still um, for a lot of states. You know, the, the first states that pass this, we're only talking 2018, 2019. Uh, then there's the onboarding period um, of getting the system set up and everything run to implement it. Uh, so we are tracking this. And that's something we put into a lot of the bills or we encourage to be in these bills, data collection. Uh, we want to make sure that we're making the best decisions uh, not just morally, but from the perspective of efficiency and data. Um, where is this working? Where is this not working? And we have a, a data and research team that really focuses heavily on that. Um, and over the next year, throughout this year, we've been working with researchers at universities you know, around the country to collect that data, analyze it, and you know, see what works best. So we can recommend that to every state that kind of moves forward on this. Do you have like a story, a heartwarming story? Mm -hmm. Let's end it on a positive note. Somebody whose life has been changed by this uh there is you know one that always stands out um it, and it was michigan um and it was a an older woman um you know probably in this i would say you know 70s if i were to guess but was there the day of the rollout it happened and just tears in her eyes and it wasn't someone who at this point was looking to get a job wasn't someone who's looking to go back to college they just didn't want to be considered a criminal or less than anymore for something it was a crime they committed i believe when they were in their 20s they wanted to feel like a human being in the eyes of, of their state of the country again and not have this stigma and to see that reaction um when you know once you're getting to later in life you, there's still obviously benefits to having your slate cleared uh but you're not worried about applying for a job anymore you just wanted to be an equal citizen again. You wanted to be a human being again. Um, and that emotional reaction to, to getting that record cleared certainly will stick with me. Um, and she still emails us um, on the anniversary of um, Michigan going into effect every year. That's always good to have, you know, that experience because you see the work that you're doing connecting and making a difference in somebody's life. It's it's important um, to really remember, you know, why all this work is being done. Um, and sometimes because, especially with our state partners, a lot of whom can be volunteers, a lot of whom have been doing this for years for, you know, nonprofit level pay, to remember that you have that impact. Um, and it can get hard. It can, you know, get demoralizing sometimes in some states when you don't feel like you're making progress. But you have to keep up that fight for those moments, for those people, because you are helping.
Well, Eric, I, I want to thank you for coming on our show this week. Great. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. We've been talking with Eric Altieri. He's the Interim Director of Campaigns for the Clean Slate Initiative. This has been Everyday Injustice. I'm your host, David Greenwald. Join us again next time for more tales from the injustice system. Thank you to George Powell and Norman Mousequake Barrett for the use of our opening, Everyday Injustice. You can see more of George's music at www.justiceforgeorgepowell.com 